there aren't men out here teaching other men what it is to be a man in a relationship with a woman, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're taught to believe that at least I was, that the extent of a man's job, protect and provide. We don't have men that are aware of what it really takes to show up as a man in a relationship. Hey, beautiful people. This is My Body Talk Show. I'm your host, Celia Lee. Firstly, thank you for tuning in. Truly grateful for your love and support, even if it's your first time. I believe the universe brought you to my show for a reason, because everything happens for a reason. In this show, we talk about self-love, relationship, dating, confidence, spirituality, mindset, health and fitness, literally everything. We talk about the real shit. Anything that empowers and helps you become the best and highest version of yourself. Every so often I will have guests on the show to talk about real life stories and have discussions on certain topics. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to my body talk show everyone. So today we have our second male guest and our second overseas guest and his name is John. Welcome to the show John. Why don't you introduce yourself to the world before we start? Well, first of all, Celia, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Um, really excited to see everything that you've done with yourself from when I first met you to now. It's an incredible, incredible transition and evolution. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is John Rios. I am a real estate broker in New York. Um, I manage a team here in New York and Connecticut. Synergy Team NY, and it's pretty much what I do. So, John, I know you be, you don't really like to talk much about your success, so <laughs> this, is, uh, this is like an interview with you, so you better shine. <laughs> don't be shy. Okay, so, um, yeah, so people, for those who don't know, so John is like, he was one of my coach, my guide, a part of this um, coaching program that I was at, and he actually helped me a lot believe it or not john you did you and victoria actually helped me a lot um and like you said when i first joined i was being as i'm not a shy person but being like kind of new to the program and being something that i'm not used to i was kind of shy and i remember you used to call me out on mm -hmm. <laughs> on your calls um and you also, also used to call, catch me off guard and i'd be like see and you'd be like celia and i'd be like okay 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 something like that um and you know what, in this podcast, it was, to be honest, you kind of helped me with it because I don't know if you remember the call we had. It was with mm -hmm. um, another like tribe member. We spoke about the podcast and I said to you that I actually been wanting to start a podcast and you just said to me, just do it. So, and I was like, you know what? Yeah, fuck it. Just do it. And this is where I want to talk about where like limiting self-belief. I used to have a lot of that. And it's only recently that I can say it's gone. Like, mm. so pretty much got rid of most of the self-belief and i want you to basically because obviously for you to be a coach you obviously because you were really you're really successful in what you do you must have had like, lots of limiting self-belief the stories that you've had could you maybe tell people about it and how you overcame them to to where you are now yeah um i think that um the the self-doubt or the self the limiting self-belief i think that Number one, I think it starts from when you're young. And and I think that you kind of go through different levels of it. Um, I don't want to say that this is everyone, but in my opinion, I think that it never goes away. I think that there's times where we break through it. And I'm of the belief that new levels, new devils is the saying. And... Um, Every time I feel like I've overcome this self-doubt and I've leveled up to a new uh, space in my life or in my career, and I want to take the next step, it kind of creeps back in. But um, it definitely started when I was actually most aware of it was um, out of high school, out of high school. Um, 
I always thought that I was going to become a baseball player. That was my lifelong dream. I'm going to become a baseball player. And um, in high school, I got I got caught up in a whole lot of other things that distracted me from that. Um, money, girls, drugs. And um, I no longer cared about playing baseball because I thought I had it all figured out. I thought at, at 16, 17 years old, I thought I had it all figured out. Um, I was like, you know what? I'm making money already. Never mind pursuing my dream of a baseball player, but even graduating high school, I was like, what do I need this for? Um, I'm, I'm already making money. Um, probably at the time making more money than my teachers. <laughs> and um, I was like, no, I don't need this. What were you making money from? Um, so, so two things, um, I was making money illegally in the street, um, selling drugs, but, um, I also was blessed and fortunate enough to get a really good job at a young age. Um, everybody in my family has a healthcare background, um, nurses, um, administration within the hospital and so on. So that was kind of like what we did my family like get a job in the hospital do your 25 years get your pension and you're good so um i got into the hospital as a housekeeper at probably 17 years old and at 17 years old making 45 fifty thousand dollars a year to me i made it i made it never mind money that I was making in the street. So it was very difficult for me to say like, okay, let me pursue something else. But in hindsight, going back to your question about the limiting beliefs, I started to eventually realize that I wanted more for myself. Mm. And the idea was like, okay, now I don't have a high school education. I don't have a college degree. I'm a Latino and I'm a convicted felon and I've been arrested. So it's like, now what do I do with myself? And I had this long stretch of time where I didn't do anything, where I kept on the path that I was on. I was like, well, this is what my life is now. This is all I can do. Um, until real estate came along. Real estate really was when I started to see what I was capable of and, and really started to believe in myself and, and think that I could do more than what I was doing at the time. What is it about real estate that made you believe that, made you believe that you can do more? So um, my entire life, um, I've always been like, big on not just helping people, but connecting people. That's always been my thing. Like mm -hmm. I always knew when you grow up in the hood, everybody wants to like talk about the negative drawbacks about growing up in, in, in like not so great neighborhoods, but there's some great things about it. And one of the things about it is that community looks out for each other. Community helps each other. So my neighborhood was very much like, oh, Robert's dad is a mechanic. So if your car is broken, go see him. Um, Jimmy's dad owns the bodega. So go see him. This guy's the butcher. So like everybody in the community kind of like connected with one another to help each other, to support each other. So that was always my mindset. And, you know, I was the guy in my family, in my neighborhood, even growing up, even to now, where everybody's like, call John, he knows somebody. Call John. John John knows somebody that can get that for you or that has somebody. So I remember um, I started watching the TV show um, Million Dollar List in New York. And first thing, there was a Latino on there. So that was like my first sign of encouragement. Like, oh, there's actually a guy that looks like me on here. Mm -hmm. 
And then the other thing was, um, was my son's mother, my wife at the time was like, you could do this. You'd be great at real estate. You could do this. You know, so many people, you know, business, you know, sales, you know, networking, you're really good at connecting. You're good at talking to people. You should try this out. And, um, I did a little research and was like, found out what it took. And I, I, I would love to say that it was such an easy transition, but it wasn't. Um, I failed the test twice. <laughs> and after failing the test twice, I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to pursue this anymore. Like, forget it. This isn't for me. And, um, I had a really bad accident while on vacation. Um, I was on vacation. I had a really bad accident. I fractured five vertebrae in my spine. I broke three ribs, had a collapsed lung. Wow. And um, mm. during that time that I was in the hospital, one of the people that I had met and spoke with regarding real estate kept following up with me. She kept following up like, Hey, did you get your license? Did you get your license? Did you get your license? And she happened to follow up with me while I was in the hospital. And I was so upset. And I picked up the phone and I said, Hey, listen, I'm in the hospital. I had a bad accident. I'm not pursuing real estate anymore. Stop calling me, stop whatever. And um, she gave me a different perspective. She said, listen, you know, this is a time for you now that you're immobilized to really slow down and focus and take the course again. So long story short, I, I took the course again while I was recovering and I ended up getting the license and here we are today. <laughs> and obviously it's not, you're not just a realtor, you actually built a team, right? Yeah. And so and then you had some awards or something. Is that all right? <laughs> Share yes. with us. <clears throat> so, um, it initially started, honestly, um, I was a single agent. I, I, I had, to, I didn't know much about the industry. Um, I was a single agent and I was doing well my first year. I was rookie of the year in my office. Um, and, um, I was doing well according to industry standards, but to me, it still wasn't good enough because mm -hmm. I left a, a career in healthcare that I was in for 15 years and I made great money. Even though I hated what I was doing, I made great money. Mm -hmm. So that was like how I set the bar coming into real estate. And when I came into real estate, everyone was like, oh, you had such a great year and they're applauding me and congratulating me on my first year. But I was like, this ain't shit because I still didn't make what I made in my previous job. So I wasn't satisfied with it. So, um, I kept wanting to go harder and harder and, um, the team actually, the, the universe brought the team situation together for me because I want to say in my second, maybe third year of my career, I got diagnosed with a really rare autoimmune disease and I got extremely sick. And in the beginning, every time I got hospitalized, it would take me out of work for three weeks, four weeks, sometimes five weeks. Wow. And in this <laughs> industry, that kills your momentum. If you're not constantly lead generating, if you're not constantly putting deals together, you lose momentum. And I quickly started to realize that my illness was affecting my business and how I would even be able to stay in the business. So at that point, I decided to build a team like, hey, listen, I'd rather give up a portion of my revenue than have no revenue. So that's what actually triggered the start of the team. And um, <clears throat> the team grew to as many as nine people at my biggest. And um this year we were, I was awarded realtor of the year in my local market. Um, 
We had a phenomenal, phenomenal year. We did around 60, $62 million in sales volume. And um, we were in the top 1% of brokers in my market. So I've done well with the team without re really just winging it. I, I really didn't have much of a playbook to follow. I was just learning on the fly. And, and um, that, that's where we are today. It's to me, I see it as you because because of your the illness, it had to almost like force you to surrender to the universe. And because, like you said, you were winging it, it's almost like you were just surrendering and just sort of like going with the flow, being the flow state, and allowing the universe to put things together for you to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And in a way, I see. Please don't take it the wrong way. No, 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 like, not at all. But, but like the illness is almost like a blessing in disguise, if that makes sense. Um, the, that, that, that's, yeah. The mm -hmm. illness was a blessing in disguise in countless ways. And mm -hmm. I can see that now. Um, and that's for most people. We can't see the blessing mm -hmm. until yeah. we're out of the situation, until we're out of the darkness to understand what that situation was teaching us, what it was showing us. So now in retrospect, looking back, obviously um, as much of a traumatic time as it was for me when I was in it, I can now see the blessings, multiple blessings in what that time taught me professionally, mentally, spiritually. So absolutely, it was a blessing in disguise. Yeah. yeah. And how now that you just, you just mentioned the word spiritually, like I want to, that actually really leads us to what I want to talk about next, which is your healing journey. Um, you had some physical healing to do. And then that's that sort of like related to releasing some trapped energy and trauma that you had. Mm -hmm. Are you okay to talk about, about that, how it helped you with your career and life, basically your healing journey. What did you do? Yeah. So, um, <sighs> So when I got di when I first got diagnosed, um, so I was diagnosed with a, a disease called type three hereditary angioedema and angioedema in itself is not, not super rare, but type three is extremely rare. At the time that I got diagnosed, there had only been 16 cases of it in the world that they had confirmed. So when I got it, um, you know, my eyes would swell shut, my lips would swell up, my tongue would swell to the point where I couldn't swallow, I couldn't breathe, they would have to intubate me and put me on a ventilator. And then I'd be in a men medically induced coma for a certain amount of time. And I bring that up because what a lot of people don't understand is that if you ever meet someone that has either been intubated or been in a coma, um, when they come out of it, when they wake up, um, you know, your family and your friends are so happy and excited. Oh, you know, they're back. Thank God our prayers have been answered, but that person is back in the physical form, but mentally and spiritually, we're still not here. A at least I wasn't. Um, I would wake up and be confused, um, very out of it, very groggy. Um, the medication was still heavily in me. I was still very sedated. And every time it happened, it took longer for me to recover mentally than the last time. So I would get discharged from the hospital and I would come back home and I wasn't right. I wasn't right. My family was happy. I was home and everybody was like, you know, thank God you're out of the woods. But in reality, for me, I wasn't mentally and spiritually. I was actually worse off. Um, I started to develop a lot of depression. Um, I got a lot of PTSD 
any little itch, any little scratch, anything that felt unusual would send me into a frenzy. I would start to panic thinking I was going to get sick and I, and I was going to be hospitalized again. So it started to affect my sleep. I had insomnia. Um, and the list just went on and on. And, um, as I started getting medical attention, nobody could really figure out what to do, how to treat it, how to control it. So everything was like basically an experiment, like, okay, we're going to give you this medication at this dose and this frequency, and let's see if it works. And I would try it. And a week later, I'd be in the hospital again. And then I'd come out and they say, okay, now we're going to try this medication with this frequency and this dose. And um, it was very stressful because it was medication that I used to have to inject myself into my, into my arms. Um, and it got to a point where I eventually blew my veins out. So I had to have a port put in my chest that was then connected to my jugular vein. Mm -hmm. And that was how I was administering my medication and so on and so forth. And eventually uh, got to a point where I had gotten into such a heavy depression and just in a cloud of darkness that I didn't want to be here anymore. I wanted, I, I wanted to kill myself. That's, that's how bad it had gotten. Um, I wasn't sleeping and then COVID hits and COVID hits and the panic and the fear got even worse. I'm getting all these calls from doctors like, Hey, you have to be careful because you have autoimmune disease. This is going to kill you. You have to be put on a ventilator when you get sick. There's a shortage of ventilators. It was just all this chaos. And um, I got to a point where right around that time, I started to hear about plant medicine. And I had known of it before, but I didn't know what it was capable of. Um, and I just became obsessed with doing more and more research on it. And I started to see that what a lot of the shamans or gurus, whatever you want to call them, would speak about was that so many of our physical ailments come from internal trauma, energy, suppressed energy, stagnant energy, um, suppressed emotion. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't aware of any of that. And the more and more I read about it, the more and more I said, I want to give this a try because I had already been a part of clinical trials for Western medicine. You know, I was staying at universities in Denver, I mean, in uh, San Diego to try things out and it just wasn't working. So I said, you know what, if I've tried everything I can locally, let me go see what these folks in the jungle are talking about. Let me go see what, what, what they got going on. And, um, that was the most pivotal point of my life, which is why I say the the disease was a blessing in disguise because going to try to heal myself physically unraveled so many other things. It 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 addressed so many other issues that I didn't know I had. And um I went on a journey of healing. I, I did countless amounts of different uh, plant medicines from Bufo to Cambo, mushrooms, ayahuasca, rape. I, I had done an onslaught of different plant medicines in ceremonial settings. And every single time, a new layer of something from my past that I wasn't a dealing with or addressing would come up and I would have to deal with it. And that, that kind of got me to the point that I am now, um, as far as my mental awareness, my spiritual awareness. So if it wasn't for the disease and if it wasn't for me wanting to address that and heal that, I wouldn't have even got on this journey. How do you know, like doing the medicines, how do you know it was um, 
the, like your physical sort of like disease to do with your past trauma? How do you know? Like I want the audience to know. Like, how do you know that? I didn't necessarily know it because I. It's not like you get some confirmation. Um, I knew it from how I started to feel mm. because the more that I addressed my trauma, I have a long history of trauma with my father. Mm. Uh, my father was very abusive verbally, physically, and there were a lot of issues with my dad that I had a lot of suppressed emotion, a lot of suppressed anger that I had never dealt with. And so many of my preliminary plant medicine ceremonies were only around my dad, around healing these issues with my dad. And the more that I became cognitive of that and wanted to deal with that, the more I started to see my symptoms lessening mm. where I wasn't having episodes as frequently as I was before. They weren't as intense as they were before. They didn't escalate like they did before. And what started to happen, the more that I started to heal and deal with emotional and spiritual issues, the better I became physically in a sense that prior to plant medicine, when I felt an onset attack coming on, I would have to inject myself with a shot, get right to the hospital. And typically I needed to be at the hospital within 25 to 30 minutes, or it was possible my airway would close and I would die. Mm. And what I started to notice was they would never escalate that quickly or that fiercely. Now they started to get milder and milder. And I was able to have more composure to deal with it when it came on to address it sometimes even meditate and work my way through it to kind of calm it down. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started to really understand the association between me dealing with my stuff internally, how it was then correlated to my symptoms physically. Mm -hmm. and, and it just became my top priority. It became the number one thing that I wanted to address. And it took all of my focus. I, I, you know, I'm not proud to say this. It's actually one of the most difficult things for me to talk about, but I left my family. I left my business. I left everything I knew to go get this help, to go do this healing work. Mm -hmm. And it was a struggle in the beginning, you know, because you feel like you have to justify this to people. What are you doing? And then people think you're crazy. Oh, you're sitting in the jungle doing, you know, drugs or crazy shit. And everybody has an opinion. Um, but yeah, it was one of the most difficult decisions I ever made, but the greatest decision I ever made in the same hand. Yeah. I was about to say, like, if you ha had you not done it, you wouldn't be where you are today. For sure. Yeah. And earlier, I'm just like, you said, it's just, I want you to explain basically just for people who are not familiar with plant medicine. You said something like every single ceremonial setting, it was just surrounded around, you were focusing on your relationship with your dad. Just explain quickly what you meant by that. Is it like your vision, your the vision kept coming up? Because some people are not familiar with plant medicine. Um. Yeah, sure. So one thing that I want to explain, I want to stress, and I've, I've been on many podcasts and I talk about this before. And one thing that I want to stress is plant medicine is not a recreational drug. And a lot of emphasis needs to be put on that because I had done mushrooms in high school and recreationally in the past. And that's what I associated with because I, I thought of it in that way. It wasn't until I learned and I did the research around 
how plant medicine is supposed to be used in a ceremonial setting for healing, for clarity, for growth, that I really understood and, and almost respected the medicine enough to only use it in, in the proper setting. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question, in the proper setting, a shaman or a guide mm -hmm. or whoever it is that you're doing this medicine with, they will tell you prior to your, your ceremony to write down your intentions. What, what are your intentions for this ceremony? What do you want to gain from it? What is it? Do you want clarity? Do you want healing from a breakup? Do you want healing from a past relationship? Do you want healing from trauma? So on and so forth. And initially, I didn't even write down my dad as an intention for healing. It just came up like the visuals were there. And I guess subconsciously, my spirit knew that that was the biggest issue. And after my first ceremony and how profound it was for me, um, that was when, and I knew what the medicine can do. That was when I became very intentional about having very specific intentions before going into my ceremonies. And I did not want to focus on anything else until I addressed these individual issues in each ceremony. And many of my beginning ceremonies were around healing the relationship with my dad and my parents and my family as a whole. Mm -hmm. I actually um, had my first plant medicine experience recently. Wow. I did um, peyote. Uh huh. And um, I never heard of it, but my friend told me about it and I did it and um, it was, I mean, I did mushrooms before, not, not uh, recreationally, but it was just, uh, my friend, he had some and we, he, he, he guided me and mm -hmm. we did it in the nature, but I didn't have um, that kind of experience. But with peyote, it was more like, like you said, had the intention. So when they put the medicine in my, in my hand, we just had to think, uh, uh, think about the intention. Mm -hmm. And, and it was mad. The intention I had was just that I wanted to, have the courage to let go. That's what I said. Have the courage to let go. Have the courage to do what it is that I want to do, and have the courage to receive abundance. And after that, it was literally there were so many like visions, and and you just know what the messages were. It's not like there was a voice telling me what it was, but I just knew what the me the message, like the lesson was to, uh, said to um, trying to tell me. And and I can honestly, I had an ego death. Mm. Um, like for example, I know I let go of so many. Um, I'm detached for so many situations. For example, one incident is basic uh, incident. I had an incident last year, um, and I couldn't let go of it because it was just so traumatic. And uh, after and during this the, um, the ceremony, I had this vision. Basically, I just saw a baby girl, and there was nothing. It was literally just a baby girl looking at me, mm -hmm. and. The message was like basically let go, mm. and then uh, and that was it. And then after that's one of them. And then um, but yeah, the ego death is basically like I now I understood what it is to be one. Like the another separation thing, like that. Like there's, I actually felt I can actually fully understand what is like. There's no gender. There's no like different race. I actually felt oneness in that moment, and that's how I knew my ego was like stripped. You, you know, I want to tell you something. Um, I have such a passion for coaching and teaching. Number one, because I love to see other people win. I love to see other people thrive. But I know that you were having a very similar ego death and transformation that I had because I could see it in you as it was happening. And for me, it was my attachment to my suit. And I talked about this many times where my insecurities of 
not being um, a college graduate, not finishing high school, being from the hood, being all of these things were hidden in my suits. So for me to go on an appointment for work, I had to have my suit. I, ha I had to. I, to go to a business meeting, I had to have my suit. And it had to be a custom suit with my initials on my sleeve and my pocket square had to match my tie and the whole bit. Mm. And when I didn't have my suit, I felt powerless. I felt like Jesus Christ, like I could never do a podcast with you right now in, in, in a t-shirt. Never, never. I would have had to have a full suit on, you know. And when my ego death came, it was like, it's you. It's you. It's not the suit. It's not the shoes. It's not the car. It's not, it's you. And I was like, holy shit. Like, and, and it sounds so simple to somebody else, but to me, it was so freeing. It was so profound mm. to understand my power. And it was like, it's not in the suit. And I saw that with you because every time when I first joined the coaching program years ago, yeah. I was just like you, I would get on the call and I would be, you know, looking away. I was just there to get the information and don't call on me, you know, trying to just fly below the radar. And I saw that with you and I would always call on you, Celia, 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 what do you think? Celia, Celia. And to see the confidence, to see the not give a fuck, if I like, excuse me, yeah. the not yeah. give a fuck that I see in you now it's so, so satisfying. It's so, so happy to see that in you <laughs> because I know it, I have felt it on both sides. And that's why I was always pushing you, silly, 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 and making you talk and making you speak and making you turn your camera on. So anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to, to distract you there or derail. No, 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 it's good. No, I'm appreciating that. But um, although to mind, like you said, like oh, I don't have a give a fuck attitude, and it's so true. Thing is, I've always had don't give a fuck attitude. I've always had that, but um, it was there's different levels of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and now definitely after the the medicine, the plant medicine, like just like today, I felt so. Free. I'm just like driving, and I'm just in that in that state where I'm just feeling feeling blissful and just gratitude and just happy, just free, mm -hmm. feel so free. And mm -hmm. honestly, I would love to do that plant medicine again, just to, I know there's still, there's still, there's still more layers that I need to sort of like heal, but um, I also would like encourage people to do it if they can to like, to sort of heal themselves. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I, I tell yeah. people all the time, I feel like, why why is it why is it that getting drunk and do and and dr consuming alcohol by the even before you turn 21 is so much more socially acceptable yeah exactly that that discussing something like this and 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 not pushing it on anyone but just making a suggestion like, hey, I see you going through some shit. I see you dealing with some things. This might help you. Mm. But but telling somebody, oh, you're having a hard time. Let's go to the bar and get drunk. That'll make you feel better. That's okay. Right? And you have a hangover and you feel like shit and you're vomiting and so on and so forth. But make a suggestion to somebody to do some deep healing and and separate and detach themselves from everything for a little while that's like oh you're crazy and you know it's taboo so i i, I strongly recommend that everybody should do it at least once yeah. in their life at least I'm once thinking. yeah 100 percent. and like you know talking about an ego like just this actually just came to my head during the ceremony so everyone has different experiences everyone so you were purged but everyone purged in a different ways mm -hmm. and you know if you I don't know about you, you probably, did you vomit? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So I didn't vomit, but um, the, the guide, he did have bucket ready for all of us to, in case we wanted to vomit. And the lady next to me, she was proper vomiting. And I did feel sick. I could feel it coming up and up and up, but it just was not coming out. And then my friend who came with me, he said he didn't feel sick, but he can see vision, but he, he was fine. Because the guide was asking everyone, like, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? And because I've always been told like, by my clients or even like some of my friends that um, they, they've seen me as the healer. Because mm -hmm. when they're around me, they said that um, they find me really healing and just um, I'm a good listener, all of that, things like that. And just um, that um, I'm very soothing in general nurturing so anyway because my friend said he he didn't feel anything and there's me feeling sick the ego started kicking in saying like well hold on a minute i'm supposed to be healer the healer i'm supposed to not feel all this kind of stuff why is it that you're not going through i'm going through it and then that like i'm just like getting a bit it was almost like i was competing with him yeah yeah and then, after, and then after the voice was like celia stop it you know a healer doesn't mean you're perfect mm -hmm. healer are far from perfect they're also healing themselves so then that's when i then i stopped thinking that and that's when i knew like the ego went, went away again <laughs> so so it's so funny you bring that up because before i did ayahuasca for the first time right i had done a couple of mushroom ceremonies so i the ego in my head was like oh i know it all now i mm -hmm. I, I got this all figured out and in addition to that, from my past life, when being in the streets, I did a lot of drugs. I had a drug problem at one time. So I thought going into ayahuasca, um, I said, if I follow this dieta perfectly, I'm not going to vomit. I'm not going to purge. That's not for me. I, 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 and then like, all this ego bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So I go into the ceremony and they told us, they said, hey, um, we're going to give you your first serving. And then about an hour or so in, we're going to ask anyone else, ask everyone if they, if they feel like they feel called to take on more medicine. And in my head, the ego again, I said, I've done so many drugs in my life. I have such a strong tolerance and I'm looking at the people in the room and I'm judging them. And I'm like, these people never been through shit. I was like, I'm going to need two and three doses of the medicine. This is what I'm telling myself. Mm. So I take the first sip and I'm like, I'm not going to vomit. I take my first dose and I start hearing people vomiting like immediately, like in the first, like, 10, 15 minutes, people are purging like crazy and, and, and you could hear it. And I'm, I'm saying to myself, you see, I'm not going to vomit. I don't feel anything. I can't wait till they ask for the second dose. I'm going to take the second dose. The second I had that final thought, ayahuasca appeared. She showed up and she said, um, come with me. And I was literally and spiritually and physically taken to the bathroom because I wasn't even going to need a bucket. I needed a toilet. <laughs> and she had me purging for about an hour and a half to the point where like, I was like begging for it to be over. Like I was just like, Oh my God. But when you start to understand and learn what that purging really means from a spiritual sense, you releasing, that's a release. That's, that's the spirit's way of almost like from a figurative standpoint, it's like the spirit's way of bleeding almost like it's releasing this thing that's got to come out of you. And even if you like dry heave and nothing comes out, that's a release. Mm. So after like all of this time of wanting to not purge, when I finally purged as much as I did and I understood what it was, I didn't care anymore after that. Every other ceremony, I was like, listen, man, if I purge, I purge. If I purge for two hours, I, I don't give a fuck. I'm here for healing and I know that's what it is. So I'm going to just take it on. Yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah, for me, it was like hearing like this lady, she was like proper throwing up. 
I was getting jealous. I was like, I want that because <laughs> it was it was you know that feeling when something's stuck and you just want yeah. to get it out. And there's, I was just like, oh please. I was thinking to myself, please just purge. And I had we had four servings, mm. um, and I was it was sort of like although I wanted to get it out, but at the same time I was nervous to take it mm-hmm. because and the next servings because I was thinking. I know how it feels if I was to vomit because that feeling is horrible. But um, I still took four servings and I still didn't vomit. Yeah. It happens. That happens sometimes. Yeah. But anyway, so that's the mas- um, the the medicine. So I want to quickly touch on toxic masculinity. Mm. And because I'm not going to lie, like, so I was listening to your one of your episode um, about you, um, on your podcast uh-huh. and you was talking about it and and it's something that obviously is to be honest is everywhere even in london you have all these men like macho man sort of thing like that and then the sort of like just the, the relationship between men is that is that how you just describe um, it well yeah, i think it, i think i think it's relationship period mm. i think i think it's men relationship with themselves I think it's an issue with man relationship with other men and also most importantly, man relationship with women. Mm. And, um, you know, I I think that as it pertains to ourselves, right. And I want to touch on all three of them, our ourselves, men, and then women, as it pertains to ourselves, um, where I grew up, the word feminine in itself has a negative connotation. So for a man to even say like they're balancing their, their, their masculine and their feminine, it's like, Oh, where I grew up and this is not my, my viewpoint, but automatically, Oh, you're gay. You're gay. Mm -hmm. If you, if you mention anything feminine, that's what that meant that you're gay and you're soft and you're all of these things. And it starts with that where like you don't even feel comfortable expressing how you really feel. You have to bottle that up, right? You have to, you know, you you can't express feelings of sadness. You can't express feelings of depression. You can't say you feel anxious, none of those things, because that's depicted as a form of weakness that's uh, uh, depicted as something shameful. So we have that inner conflict with ourselves where this toxic masculinity culture has taught us that internally we shouldn't feel those things. Which is why mental health with men is quite a big thing. For sure, Uh, for sure. So we shouldn't feel those things with ourselves, right? Then as it pertains to other men, right? Now we have the issue of it not being okay to express emotion to our brothers, right? Where I grew up, my father never, my father never kissed me. My father never hugged me. Me and my father have kissed and hugged and said, I love you to each other more times in the past year and a half since he's been sick than in my entire life. And when I realized that it was a problem within our male community was when I came back from doing so much medicine and I would see my brothers, I would want to help them. I would want to share my experiences with them to hopefully have them go and do some healing too. But leaving a conversation with them and saying, I love you. They got really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. Like some, like some dudes were like violently uncomfortable. Like, bro, don't say that to me. Cause again, it's, it, it's like, that's gay. That's, mm. that's, that's homosexual. You, you're, you, you aren't supposed to share that with me. And the more and more I did it amongst my friends, the more and more it starts to slowly become okay. The more I gave them a safe space to talk to me about things like, Hey, if you're going through something, I'm here. Right. 
If you want to cry, if you want to whatever, we could do that here safely. In the beginning, I was like, all right, John, enough, enough, enough. Then after a while, I started getting those late night phone calls about very intimate things. And then it became more comfortable. So we have that issue amongst ourselves and the male community. And then as far as it relates to our women, our queens, our our, our women, um, we struggle because there aren't men out here teaching other men what it is to be a man in a relationship with a woman, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We're, we're, we're taught to believe that at least I was that the extent of a man's job, protect and provide. I take care of my household. I make money. I pay bills. That's it. My job's done. Mm -hmm. And we don't have men that are aware of what it really takes to show up as a man in a relationship because you either had a horrible example of it in your life and that's the majority of us or you didn't have anyone around you to tell you any different so if you don't know that this isn't right you're never going to change it so um the toxic masculinity is a is a is a deep topic and um you know, I don't know if that answers your question, but that that's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. No, no, it does. It does. Um, what about when you say with yourself? The masculine and stuff like you said, the relationship with yourself. How does that, how's that changed for you? Oh, it's, it's changed drastically for me because I was always of this barbaric, old school, like Neanderthal thought which is most men work yourself to the ground, right? The harder you're working, the more you're hustling, you know, the, the better or bigger, badder of a fucking man that you are. And the more I understood that nah, I don't need to be working every single day. It's okay for me to take a day off and focus on my self care. It's okay for me to, do things that might be deemed um, <clears throat> unmasculine. Go get a massage, go get a pedicure, go get a manicure, go get a facial, go do something outside of being a brute and being, you know, th this hunter mentality, right? Hunters and gatherers, very prehistoric, antiquated way of thinking. And for me, that became a priority. It was a priority. It was like, okay, I'm going to make a very small amount of time for myself every single day mm -hmm. before I start my day. But there's going to be days where that might not be enough. I might need the whole fucking day. I might need the whole weekend. And that's okay. And and I think that, you know, this, this society of we have to grind, 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 work till we're dead. It, it it has such a negative impact on the man because he's working himself physically through the ground, which leaves him no time to deal with what he's dealing with mentally and physic and spiritually. And then you don't know how to show up in relationships and it just becomes a domino effect. You don't take care of yourself. Then you can't take care of those around you. And, and, and it turns into a, an avalanche. Mm, yeah so i'm gonna wrap up mm -hmm. now um what advice do you have for people in general oh man that's a loaded question <laughs> um don't put yourself in a box don't put yourself in a box and the reason why i'm even saying that right now is because um I've been struggling with a career decision um, over the past few months. And it's because we constantly put ourselves in a box, right? Mm -hmm. And 
once we're in that box, it's almost like we have to stay there for good. And for me, it's being a realtor, being a real estate broker. And I've thought about these other things that I want to do, other careers and, and passions that I have and things that I want to pursue. And my limiting belief, like I mentioned to you before, new levels, new devils, it comes back has always been like, well, this is what I do. I, I created something here. It's successful. Stay here. You established. You're good. It's safe. And um, it's okay to put your take yourself out of the box. It's okay to put on a new hat and envision yourself as something else and pursue something else at any stage of your life, at any age. And, um, you know, don't worry about the how. Yeah. Just... Just go after it. Just yeah. go after it. And when that passion is gone for whatever it is that you're pursuing, it's okay to find passion in something else and pursue something new. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Absolutely love that. Because when I, because I used to be in events before I personal trainer and I did really well. Um, like my biggest event was I did was 5,000 people in an exhibition. And because that was like my top of my bucket list, that's my list to do had ticked it off and then I felt like I was done in that mm. career I was ready to become a personal trainer and my parents were like what are you doing with yourself even some of my friends they were like what are you doing are you crazy like you had a good job and you were doing really well like what happened don't, don't you love don't do you not love events I, was like, I still love events but I just feel like right now I've reached that milestone I'm ready to move on mm -hmm. and yeah so no I that, absolutely agree with what you're saying um how can people get hold of you um, you can get a hold of me on Instagram, John J. Rios. Um, same handle everywhere Instagram, TikTok, uh, LinkedIn. And, um, you know, I'm an open book. I get DMs and questions all the time from people messaging me from other podcasts they've seen. You can reach out any questions. I promise I'll get back to you at some point, but, um, definitely we'll get back to you if you have a question you want to reach out. Mm -hmm. all right thank you so much john thank you thank you no, so, thank so you much. thank you it's a it's a pleasure to be here and um i want to tell you that you're doing incredible i see all of your hard work um and not just the stuff that shows up on the outside i can see it in your energy i can feel it in your vibration um very very different from when i first met you i am so proud of what you've done, what you're doing, and where you're headed, right? Because this is not even the ceiling for you. So mm. keep doing what you're doing. And thank you for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. I'm honored that you agreed to do this. Not gonna lie. Of course. Um thank you again for listening or watching if you enjoyed that and found it relatable then please share it with your loved ones also follow the show so you don't miss out any episodes you can follow me on instagram at i am dot celia lee it is spelled with an i not an e so c-i-l-i-a-l-i -I -I. thank you love you lots <laughs>